Optimal health for high performers. This is the Health Upgrade Podcast with Dr. Nawaz Habib. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Health Upgrade Podcast. Joining me today, I've got JP Erico, my co-host. Hi, JP. Hi, how are you? Yes, I'm great. We have a very special guest here today. This is Abigail Butterfield. Thank you so much for joining us today, Abigail. Hi, thanks for having me. Wonderful. So we are honored to talk to you today about your journey because as a healthcare practitioner, you have a perspective and as a bit of a patient in your own right, you have a a slightly different perspective. And what it seems like is over the last little while, you've been able to come up with an understanding of what you've gone through and how we can potentially help others that might be suffering from similar conditions. So we're really excited to speak with you today and kind of understand your journey and understand how we can potentially help those others out there. So why don't we jump in and understand a little bit about your journey as becoming a healthcare practitioner, as a nurse practitioner you are, and also understand how you came to be diagnosed with EDS. So it's been a long road for me, I guess. I've always been a patient, been kind of abnormal ever since I was born, but I didn't really know how abnormal it was until I guess I started working in medicine. (laughs) But I was in the hospital a lot, had a lot of joint problems growing up, always was very athletic, but needed for rotator cuff surgeries going through middle school and into high school, had a lot of joint subluxations and dislocations, and just a lot of issues that other kids and teenagers didn't have. So I was in physical therapy a lot, the hospital surgeries and things like that. So I was very interested in medicine. So it kind of helped spark that idea in my brain of what can I do to help people? I felt like I had a really good connection with patients and people. And I thought this is something I want to do. And so I started off in nursing and I got my bachelor's and then I pursued my master's and I worked as a uh, nurse practitioner, as an adult and geriatric nurse practitioner. And I was able to kind of along that time become diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Actually, while I was in school, I was diagnosed with it because I had a spontaneous pneumomediastinum. And then they said, well, why does that happen? And they look into then why do you have POTS and all of these things? And I was diagnosed with EDS. And so on my journey there, I was able to see sometimes the misfortune that happens in the medical healthcare system with EDS patients when you have an invisible illness. And Then I really, when I was working as a nurse practitioner, I wanted to help people more that have EDS. And I started looking into what is the root cause of this? Why is this happening? When you look into it, it's supposedly so rare, but I personally don't believe it's very rare. I just believe it's rarely diagnosed in patients. So now I switched gears and I went back to school and I got my postmasters and I switched to psychiatry and functional medicine. And it's kind of funny how many people I'm seeing actually being coming to me and they already have a diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And so that's exciting for me because when I was younger, no physician even knew what I was talking about when I said I had that. So I've really just been on a journey to come as healthy as I can be and as well as I can be. And then also sharing the knowledge that I've found along my way with my patients and how I can help them as well. So let's step back for a second. And Abby, you and I have known each other for quite some time. Can you tell us a little bit more about what EDS is? For those people out there who don't know what Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is, I have to admit, I didn't know what it was until maybe about eight years ago, eight, nine years ago, when I was introduced to it by, believe it or not, a gastroenterologist. But why don't you let the audience know what Ehlers-Danlos or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome is? Yeah, so Ehlers-Danlos, or I call it EDS for short. It's a group of irritable connective tissue disorders. There's, I believe, last 13 subtypes. And it's due to an abnormality in collagen. And we know that collagen is one of the most abundant proteins in our body that helps strengthen and support the tissues in our body, including like your skin, your bones, your tendons muscle. And so it impacts nearly every system. So there's this abnormal collagen and it leads to joint hypermobility, 
from lax ligaments, skin hyperextensibility and tissue fragility. And there's a lot of different subtypes that those people might have cardiac issues. They may have problems with teeth, eyes, all sorts of different things, but they're looking at the presence of that abnormal collagen causes comorbidities such as POTS, mast cell activation, GI issues, anxiety, all sorts of things like that. So it really does affect more than just joints and joint hypermobility for the hypermobile type. Yes, there's a tremendous amount of interaction, if you will, between the autonomic nervous system and collagen. Collagen deposition is regulated and controlled by the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system and the nervous system in general is protected by different forms of collagen that are involved in myelination and in support of the larger structures of the brain and the nervous system. So collagen having problems, as you said, genetically not structured properly can lead to all sorts of different problems. And because there are 13 different subtypes, there are different severities, if you will, of the condition and different symptoms that arise as a result. Why don't we dive into some of those symptoms right away, just to sort of give people a, a sense about it. You talked about that skin hyperextensibility, the joint hypermobility. In fact, outside the United States in the UK, which is where I first heard about it, it's referred to as joint hypermobility syndrome. So they don't use the term Ehlers-Danlos to describe it. So there happens to be a great paper, and, and here on the podcast, we like to give credit to great authors out there, great researchers who are doing good work. And one of the great papers that's come out just within the last couple of years, and, and actually, I believe, Abby, you originally forwarded it to me. The lead author is a woman by the name of Courtney Jensimer. It's from June of 2020. Uh, the title of the review article is Hypermobility, Ehlers-Danlos Syndromes, Complex Phenotypes, Challenging Diagnoses, and Poorly Understood Causes. It's a great paper because it really reviews all of the different symptoms or phenotypes, if you will, of the disease. And one of the biggies, because it's called joint hypermobility syndrome, is, of course, the musculoskeletal manifestations, which are primarily, as you said, along the lines of dislocating the inability of the tendons and ligaments to hold the joint in place. And you see people who are hyper, hyper flexible, sort of like when you go to see uh, the Cirque du Soleil shows, you see people who are incredibly, incredibly flexible, and many of them probably have some form of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. In your life, you talk about some of the things that have happened to you. Is it something that just happens to you every once in a while? Or do you live with that level of flexibility and sort of abnormal mobility, if you will, all the time? Yeah, no, it's all the time. So when you're younger, it's always like your party tricks that you can do. You can <laughs> kind of put yourself into odd pretzel formations or different poses and things like that. I think you mentioned the people in the circus, the person that can like stretch their skin and pull their skin really far. That's like one of those classic EDS patients that you would see there. But for me, it's like every day it affects you. So your shoulder may be falling out of place, your hip popping out of place. You move the wrong way and you just have severe spasms because things are way too lax and then your body tries to correct that. So unfortunately, it is something that affects you day in and day out. When you talk about the fact that your body compensates for the fact that connective tissue isn't able to support the joint, the other type of tissue that helps to support joint structure are, are muscles. And if as a result of the fact that the ligaments and tendons aren't able to sort of keep joints together in a non-painful way and functional way, the muscles get relied on far more than in normal. And I would imagine that that leads to either muscle pain or other muscle symptoms. And you've talked about some of the other things that you've done to try to relieve yourself of pain associated with those muscle spasms, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know dry needling was one of the things you talked about. Yeah. So for me, and in, in my case, with the hypermobility, everything is kind of moving out of place. The vertebrae may move more than they normally would. And so your muscles try to compensate and then you get a lot of spasm, right? To try to 
create stability that's not there. So even when I would go to physical therapy and someone might know about EDS and all they know is, oh, well, you're really loose. And they would go, but how do you have tight, tense muscles and muscle spasms everywhere? And then they would do range of motion exercises on me and go, oh my gosh, you are so hypermobile. You are so loose. But at the same time, I'm feeling these knots everywhere on you. You are in spasm everywhere. And so that's really what I live with all the time. And One of the best things that I found for me personally, chiropractic adjustments really help because when you're out of alignment, everything is just in spasm trying to get you back to that baseline normal, whatever your normal is. For me then personally, I had a doctor who also had an acupuncture doctor in his office and he did dry needling and it's insane. So he can just use the same acupuncture needle and just hit that spasm. And he always tells me it's like butter, that spasm just releases. And that has been something that has been so great for me to find out that that is something that can offer relief for me, where it doesn't offer too much mobility to where you start having injury, but just enough that I go back to not having as much pain. This is an interesting point because as a chiropractor myself, we hear about it, we learn about it and obviously in chiropractic college. And then obviously I appreciate the plug, but understanding that when you get your hands on a patient and you're able to feel that mobility is so great, but the muscle tension underlying is so severe, it really is a sign. If there are any chiropractors listening right now or chiro students, there is a very, very strong correlation between muscle tension because the muscles are essentially compensating for the joints that are unable to maintain their mobility. The ligaments are unable to remain nice and strong. And so in order to allow for or prevent the subluxation or dislocation of joints, the muscles are literally hyperactive and hypertonic trying to compensate for this patient's challenges. And it happens throughout the body because it's a genetic issue. It's not Uh, located in a single joint. It's not located in one particular area of the body. It happens everywhere. And so, A, yes, we do need to do a lot of work to support the muscular function of these particular patients. And dry needling is actually one of those really great tools. Acupuncture in itself is a well-known modality that's been used for thousands of years. But what it does, the effect of the needle is actually to affect fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are the cells that lay down the collagen, that actually physically lay down collagen around. And what we're doing when we're using either acupuncture or dry needling technique that also involves a little bit of motion of the particular needle is activation of fibroblasts. There are some really great studies. I don't have the links off the top of my head or the names of the authors off the top of my head, but There's a really great study that showed needles that are just placed versus needles that are actually twisted. When they're twisted, you have increased fibroblast activity, even more activity. That's why something like dry needling works as well as it does. So it's a really cool thing to hear it from your perspective, from that patient perspective, understanding that we're affecting the fibroblast, but the real effect is on the patient's ability to move and symptom management. It's really quite interesting to hear that. So let's dive into the next piece of the symptomatology of Ehlers-Danlos or EDS, which is you were referring now a couple of times to the skin hypermobility, the ability to stretch skin in a hyperextensible way. But that's not the only skin manifestation. I think it's pretty clear that collagen in skin, if it's not formed properly, might lead to that hyperextensibility. But unlike ligaments and tendons where there's muscles to support the tissue within the tissue within skin you don't have that or to a much lesser degree you have that but there are other things that happen that are related to the immune system and the autonomic nervous system that are in the skin your skin is obviously innervated and it has immune cells that are easily activated and so could you talk a little bit about some of the skin symptoms things like rashes and flushing and other responses that you've had that sort of almost indicate a hypersensitivity reaction as opposed to something that would sort of naturally be considered a consequence of collagen malformation? I think there's a lot of different components that are due to EDS and the comorbidities with it. But so with the skin in general, there's 
a lot of tissue fragility. So there's poor wound healing. If you get a wound or you have surgery, that wound may not heal like a normal individual skin. It may tear back open easily. When you do heal, you may have that cigarette paper scar tissue, which can cause a lot of problems for patients. So for me, flushing is a horrible, I'm a very fair skinned individual. And with the autonomic nervous system dysfunction that goes along with it, anytime my body gets in a little bit of, I think, sympathetic overdrive or fight or flight mode, I get horrible flushing neck, face, chest, and people will go, oh my gosh, are you okay? And I'm like, I'm fine. And I look in the mirror and I'm just covered in, in blotchy redness. So, and I know JP, you mentioned that once before we were talking and I was just excited in what I was talking about and you'd be like, are you okay? So that's a little embarrassing too, but the rashes that you mentioned, and this is all my individual experience with it, but the food sensitivities that I've run into that have gotten worse as I've gotten older, I think I personally don't detox very well. And so I was starting to get a lot of issues with rashes even just with eating certain foods that normally never bothered me or coming into contact with different things outside. And then it started to be, I didn't even know why it was happening. I was just getting rashes everywhere, my face, my neck, all over myself. There's a lot of skin manifestations that goes along with it, but I think that it's caused from a lot of different things from overactive immune system, toxins that you're not able to really get rid of very well, and then some trouble with your autonomic nervous system just being real wonky. Exactly. And that autonomic nervous system and immune system connection is something that we've spent a lot of time on this podcast talking about. Because, of course, the autonomic nervous system is your brain's or your nervous system's mechanism for modulating your inflammatory responses. And it sounds to me like there's a lot of inflammatory dysfunction in EDS that is probably due to, and the literature seems to indicate, is due to that autonomic nervous system being out of whack. Obviously, being in considerable pain associated with that, everything from dislocations to the muscle spasming and other things that we'll get to can lead to that sympathetic overdrive just based on your perception of pain. It's not uncommon to see people who have pain syndromes have cutaneous responses, rash responses, and as a result, uh, poor healing, et cetera. But this is specifically genetically driven. What are some of the things that you've seen along the way that have arisen as new problems? You we're talking about new foods. And in your discussions with other people who have EDS, are there certain foods or alcohol that are just things you just need to avoid and other people have experienced the same things. So alcohol is a big one, especially wine, red wine. I can have a little bit of that. I just am instantly like stuffy and red everywhere. And then my joints, my actual knees, my hands will completely turn red. My knees will turn red, my toes and everything is just kind of pulsating. Like I can just physically barely move around. And so alcohol is definitely one that flares that up for me. Chocolate, anything that's high in histamine, I've come to find over time. Anything that is spicy, a lot of spices really inflame me. So that sugary things, all those things that I really love to eat, <laughs> <laughs> I've found that have those have given me a lot of problems. And a lot of other people that I've talked to have the same issues with a lot of the same foods and drinks and things like that. I'm curious, are there any foods that you found not just help you remain kind of at the same level, but actually improve symptoms at all? Foods, I think if I have a lot of veggies, I do really good. For me personally, doing like almost like a modified keto slash Mediterranean diet. So having low carb, low sugar, high veggies and proteins, really avoiding those processed, like high processed foods. I would love to be able to have things that contain a lot of vitamin C, but unfortunately those foods that are high in vitamin C really irritate my bladder and my interstitial cystitis. 
So I have to be really careful of that on like which fruits I eat, but I try to eat a lot of fruits um, as well. But then I also do vitamin C infusions. And that has seemed to be very helpful for me in places where I couldn't have a ton of fruit trying to stay like in ketosis or something like that. That makes a lot of sense to me because with the heavily processed foods, we're triggering an inflammatory reaction. We're essentially saying that in a situation like EDS, your cup is already a bit smaller. It's a little bit shorter cup simply because genetically you don't have the ability to lay down effective collagen the same way that somebody who doesn't have that same mutation would be able to. Essentially what that does is it says when you are under threat and we are trying to go into a repair zone, we're not able to go into that zone as easily because we don't have that genetic ability. So really interesting that that it would be. And interestingly, that's a very similar diet to what I recommend to a lot of people that are suffering from not just EDS, but many other similar conditions as well. When Abby and I first spoke, we had a series of different conversations over a couple of months. And one of the things that we sort of I think learned together, or maybe you already knew, Abby, and you were just kind enough to tell me that it was new information, was the short-chain fatty acids and fats and oils that were very soothing and helpful, not only for just your abdominal symptoms, but also overall. Because I would imagine, and we've talked a lot about this, leaky gut syndrome is clearly a big problem in society today, but it's also something that would be exacerbated by having poor collagen deposition. That very, very thin, one cell thick layer between what's effectively the outside, which is your intestines, and the inside of your body is probably much more prone to leakiness and reinforcing that tissue and the microbiome that's in the gut with short chain fatty acids like butyrate and oils like olive oil and good um, vegetable oils that are not overly processed would be a really positive thing. And one of the things we've talked about on the podcast, and it's worth repeating, is that all foods really boil down to three different categories. There are carbohydrates, there's proteins, and there's fats. And if you look at what happens to the immune system after eating each one of those different categories, it's a very radically different immune response. Proteins typically have a mild short-term immune activation, it's a low level of activity, and then it comes right back down. Fats have virtually no immune activation of any kind. As unappetizing as it sounds, you could probably sit and drink eight ounces of olive oil, and it would have no negative effects on your immune system. Carbohydrates, on the other hand, are incredibly immunogenic. They react with your immune system and cause your immune system to respond aggressively and for an extended period of time. And it's unfortunate because you also talked about processed foods. One of the things that's happened over the last 50 to 60 years in the United States, especially, but also throughout the Western world, is this adoption of removing fat and what are really healthy fats from food in order to advertise them as low fat. And in order to keep the calorie and the taste that the manufacturers believe that people will want, they add in carbohydrates, especially simple carbohydrates, but carbohydrates nonetheless. And as a result, I would imagine that processed foods, as you mentioned, would be particularly aggressively exacerbating of your symptoms. So let's talk a little bit more about how long those symptoms last in you, because it happens to all of us that we have that immune response. But in EDS patients, I would imagine that one bad meal doesn't simply just last for a couple hours for you. It lasts a lot longer. And I know you and I have talked about that. So you want to give a little bit of background on that or a little experience? Yeah. In my experience, I will definitely notice within probably 30 minutes to an hour of eating something, maybe even sooner, I start to have the flushing, the joint pain, throbbing, like pulsating just sets in a lot of stuffiness. You know, I feel just a lot of mucus production. Then I'm like, eh, okay, you know, whatever, it's fine. But then a couple hours later, I might start to have a lot of GI upset, a lot of nausea, terrible, terrible bloating to the point where 
I remember a patient one time looking at me and they were like, are we expecting? And I'm like, no, I just had some stuff with some gluten in it. And they're like, oh no, we're expecting, aren't we? So I would have just so much bloating in the abdominal area. And that's so uncomfortable to say the least. And that would last at least through the next day. And so anytime I really eat something I'm not supposed to, I pay for it in all of those aspects. But the most bothersome symptom to me is the pain and the fatigue and the discomfort is awful, but the brain fog, like the cognitive impairment that I have from eating the wrong foods is just kind of debilitating for me because I need my brain for my job and just in functioning day to day, that has been something that has really affected me. And it took a lot of time for me to figure out what bothers me when I eat it or drink it and what I need to avoid to be able to function optimally. So that's a great topic. And we've spent a lot of time on the podcast talking about cognitive dysfunction, brain fog type symptoms that arise as a result of peripheral inflammations. What you're basically describing is that your body is super reactive. Your immune system is super activated by the wrong types of food, which really include certain proteins like gluten, but also carbohydrates in general. And that when that activates you, sugars, et cetera, when that activates you, it isn't just a local problem in your your gastrointestinal tract. We've all had experience of going to uh, bad Mexican food or, or a bad fish or something like that. And you have GI upset and it may last even 12 to 24 hours. But what you're describing is lasting longer than that. And it goes beyond just your abdominal tract. It's going to your peripheral immune system and response in your skin and response in your joints and response probably in other organs as well. And it's also affecting your ability to think because that inflammation is activating microglial cells in your central nervous system. They become activated. They're not helping to form new memories, to help you learn, to help when you sleep. And we're going to get to sleep in a second because that's a big thing I know for you as well. Sleep is where you have the ability to form new memories and to consolidate things that you've learned. And really, it's a detoxification process in your brain. You said you had a difficult time detoxing. But since it came up, let's talk about sleep because I know that uh, that's a big one for you. Sleep is definitely a challenge. I've not been blessed to be a great sleeper, <laughs> but I think that that's hard when you have a lot of pain and, you know, just on a daily basis. And then, you know, if you eat the wrong things and you're flared up for several days after and you are having a hard time getting in a comfortable position or you were comfortable, but now for whatever reason, you're uncomfortable and you need to keep readjusting all night. So that's really hard for me. I have a lot of neck issues. I have a lot of neck cervical instability. So really just making sure at all times that my neck is in an okay position so that I don't tweak it and that I'm a mess the whole following day or week. But I have had a lot of weird issues. I don't know how much it all plays into it, but I've had a lot of jaw, like TMJ. So I'm a terrible grinder. I've always been like a very angry sleeper, apparently. I've cracked crowns and teeth with grinding. And so I just don't sleep well. And then I've had some issues with parasomnias my whole life where you wake up and I think it's the sympathetic overdrive my body gets in. So I have a lot of issues with night terrors that come at odd times. And I really do think like the different stressors that my body is under will sometimes exacerbate that. I may not have any issues with them for a long time. Or if I forget my atenolol, my beta blocker, I have a very rough time with that too. So a lot of racing heart palpitations, things like that. So it is definitely something that affects sleep. So I don't have good quality of sleep and I have a hard time feeling like really rested after I, I get up. Really goes to show the importance of parasympathetic function and being able to get into simply that rest and digest system. On the digest side, you mentioned the brain fog coming from particular foods, that gut brain connection we know is so strong, just something to quickly outline via the vagus nerve in particular, but it is a very, very important connection that needs to be functioning at a high level. And if it's not, you're going to have hyperinflammatory challenges occurring in the gut then affecting brain function and creating that brain fogginess. On the heart side of things, 
it's interesting from a symptomatic perspective we need that beta blocker to help maintain lower resting heart rate get you into more of a rest digest or rest uh, parasympathetic focused state so that you can sleep and then in addition to that we have this massive immune response and inflammatory response treating causing this physical discomfort that makes it really difficult to get into a good comfortable position allowing you then to get into sleep where the vagus nerve is most active so it's very important connection point here to understand that like the autonomics need to be functioning in a very good balance point and in eds it sounds very much like sympathetic activation is already kind of the baseline and parasympathetics need a lot of work to be able to get up nice and high yeah so maybe this is a great segue and thank you for that for talking about vagus nerve because one of the reasons why abby and i got in contact originally was not simply to talk about her medical conditions it was actually because as a healthcare provider we were talking about working together and we were originally scheduled to have as i mentioned before a quick 30 minute or 60 minute conversation and it ended up being over three hours and led to multiple conversations over the next following weeks that were equally long and involved and as a result of that, one of the things that Abby started using was a vagus nerve stimulator, which she had not tried before. And so maybe it's an opportunity to talk a little bit about some of the symptoms that were very immediately affected by that introduction of vagus nerve stimulation into your the rest of your things that you were doing. And, and maybe maybe I'll ask the following questions in series. You know, the first question would be prior to beginning vagus nerve stimulation the efforts that you had undertaken with diet and with exercise and with other behavioral modifications, things you were doing, what percentage benefit would you say that you had over what would otherwise be your baseline? And then how much benefit did you find? And maybe be specific about things like sleep and headache and anxiety and things like that we've talked about. How much did the vagus nerve stimulation impact it? Was it a small, large, in between, how, how would you sort of describe it? Huge. Non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation for me has been huge. I was on a very limited diet of things that I knew I could eat, like my safe foods. And I felt like over time, my safe foods were becoming smaller and smaller because with your leaky gut and you're eating these safe foods, now they're no longer your safe foods because you're not rotating things enough. So when I was able to figure out that, okay, I'll try vagus nerve stimulation, see if this helps, because I was finding a lot of information that was talking about the cervical instability and how that caused vagus nerve compression and how that really caused a lot of inflammation and dysfunction in the body. So you're like, okay, what do I do to help fix this? And when I tried VNS, I do one on my neck. It's a little two minute stim. And I'm thinking, okay, something that's supposedly going to help all these things. Well, in medicine, when you hear something that's going to help fix all these things, it starts to raise red flags, usually in my line of work. How can one thing fix so many things? But when you're treating like that underlying dysfunction, it becomes possible to fix so many things at once. So when I used VNS, one of the things that I was targeting was migraines because it's FDA approved for migraine treatment. And I had horrible migraines. So I would get Botox every three months, adjustments, massage. So I actually was able to abort migraines. And then through using it long term, I found that I'm able to prevent migraines. So when I became pregnant, I couldn't do Botox anymore. And I was terrified. I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to function? I only had through my pregnancy, two migraines that were bad that I was not able to completely abort with using my VNS. So that was huge. But I also found to my surprise that my food sensitivities were so much better. I wasn't getting rashes when I was eating certain foods. So the foods that I could normally not tolerate, I was allowed to put them back in my diet. And that was something that I was not expecting. So that was huge for me. My sleep seemed like it got a lot better. I wasn't grinding and clenching my jaw as much. And I could tell because of how chewed up in the inside of my mouth is, how tight and tense in my muscles are. And the big one that I've read literature on, but I really wasn't thinking about how much it would help it is anxiety and depression. And so there's a lot of literature that talks about vagus nerve stimulation and how over time it can be very helpful for anxiety and depression. 
But when I did um, DNS, it was almost like I had it taken an anxiolytic medication. And just instantly, I felt very calm and overall just much, much better state of mood. And it lasted through the whole day. So those are just a few things that I noticed immediately. Over time, I noticed that my pain was better. And I noticed that my chronic pain was better because if I would forget to use my simulator, I would be like, oh my gosh, I'm in so much pain. Like what is going on? And then I'd realize, oh, I didn't stim today. And I would stim and within like 30 minutes or so, I would notice like that pain was just improving immensely. So really over time, I just was able to see a lot of areas that it was making my quality of life just so much better. Excellent. So let's talk about something that you brought up just now, which is you experienced some benefits during the period of time that you were pregnant. And I'm going to dive into this issue because it's one you and I have talked about, and I'm sort of going to out you about this. There was a period of time where you didn't believe that you were, it was possible for you to get pregnant, that you had actually tried for a number of years and had sort of come to the conclusion that as an EDS patient, it was not possible. Then even without trying, once you began using vagus nerve stimulation regularly, it sort of happened spontaneously. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I had been told when I was 25 by a reproductive endocrinologist that I was, my ovaries were kind of starting to fail and I would never have kids. And I had tried for many years and nothing ever happened. So I just figured, well, that's not part of my journey. And I started using my stimulator. And the first time I tried, I mean, I had been using it about, say, maybe six, eight months at that point, like consistently, the first time I tried, I got pregnant. And that had not happened for 10 plus years before, no matter what I did. I remember talking to my OB about that. And of course, he was like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but you know, whatever. (laughs) But he was very understanding in the chronic inflammation that I had, and how lowering that inflammation could set me up for an area where I would be able to conceive where I hadn't previously been able to. Yeah, you talked about some of the interstitial cystitis that you had previously. I'm assuming that those symptoms were also affected by the reduction in inflammation associated with the stimulation of the vagus nerve. Because, And maybe let's take a, a moment here to talk about what vagus nerve stimulation does to the immune system. Stimulating the vagus nerve activates cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway. There's actually a series of different pathways, but the most prominent, or at least the one that's most well-known at this point, is that when you stimulate the vagus nerve, it reduces the activity of macrophages and microglial cells through the release of acetylcholine. The release of acetylcholine associated with parasympathetic activation, I should say, leads to an activation of a pathway that involves a, a certain receptor. We've talked about the alpha-7 nicotinic acetylcholine receptor that's activated by acetylcholine release, and that down-regulates the immune system. And it happens very, very, very rapidly. So it's not surprising that you would have sort of global symptom improvement, even to the extent of mood and pain perception within a matter of under an hour, within 30 minutes or even sooner, because it's such a rapidly affected system. Now, getting back to the pregnancy and the fact that you were able to conceive where you hadn't conceived before, And perhaps, we don't know, perhaps that was just coincidence. I mean, coincidence has happened. But there were other things that you experienced during the pregnancy and just being able to carry your wonderful daughter to term. And after the pregnancy, during that postpartum period where you're breastfeeding and other things that you might want to talk about, because we've heard about this from other people. We haven't necessarily talked about it on the podcast, but we've heard about this effect on lactation and other things. So what were your experiences with that? I think it definitely helped me with my pain because my pain was through the roof, through the pregnancy. I have L5S1 fusion on one side. So as your ligaments get more lax, more problems with pain and just joint subluxations and dislocations. And so I was honestly miserable. And I think if I wouldn't have had my stimulator 
I would never have made it through using it while I was pregnant. I remember going and I had to do weekly monitoring where they would hook me up so they could monitor the baby and her activity. And they were telling me that that's totally out of my scope of practice. This is looking at the baby's sympathetic nervous system. And, and they were so happy with how she looked every appointment. And my doctor would say for someone that has a lot of high risks and abnormalities, the baby looks stellar. This sympathetic tone and our parasympathetic tone looks great on this baby. So I was always attributing that to me using my vagus nerve stimulator so consistently every single day. And then when I had her, I was like, horribly engorged after. And I remember I had like multiple lactation people coming in and seeing me and they were like, we're not used to seeing someone like this engorged. You're going to have to get some out. And when I first produced them within a couple of days, I filled up both containers, like all the way to the top with my milk. My milk production was just great. Unfortunately, she ended up back in the NICU and with stress and no sleep constantly, your milk production, just mine crashed. And so I noticed when I would stim, I would immediately within probably 15 minutes or so, I would have like a ton more milk production. I knew I should have been stimming probably more to help that through the pregnancy. But with COVID and things, I was a little nervous on like, if I would run out of my stim, you know, being able to have it, what I would do to replace it because that was so important. So I would only use it one time a day. But it was very helpful for helping that milk let down for me. And I think, too, I didn't have any issues with postpartum depression. And for me, I was very worried about that and anxiety. So we almost lost our baby when she was about five days old. And I really think that having my stimulator was so helpful for me for just keeping my anxiety and depression in check at a time that I could have seen it being something very unmanageable. And I felt like I pulled through it very well. And I was able to just function as a mom. And then I had to go back to work. And I was also getting my postmasters at the same time. So you were able to do quite a bit. Yes. Now, you talked about a lot of the immune activation uh, symptoms that you attribute to vagus nerve stimulation helping to reduce. But of course, during pregnancy, you expect to see many of the immune symptoms. We see it with autoimmune diseases. They sort of go into remission during pregnancy because the female body during pregnancy has a lot of anti-inflammatory signaling going on. It's actually associated with the interface between the placenta and the uterus. There's a series of different macrophages that are interacting with one another. The maternal macrophages are the decidual macrophages. Then you have the placental macrophages, the macrophages that are actually not part of the baby directly, but are actually in the placenta that are part of that foreign mass. Those are called Hofbauer cells, and they are releasing tremendous amount of anti-inflammatory signaling to suppress the immune system. So the mother has a low level of pathological inflammation during that period. Lots of other changes happen, more blood, hair, small skin growth, things like that. But once you got past that or before that, you were still seeing those same benefits. And so I guess one of the things that people see, I know you went through a lot of stress with your baby being in the NICU and other things, but compared with other stressful situations in your life, and maybe nothing's ever comparable to that level of stress, but did you find that in the postpartum period where people go through postpartum depression or postpartum symptoms, did you find that they were manageable, normal, abnormal, or otherwise? For me personally, I was very worried about the possibility of some postpartum depression with those hormonal shifts. And then when you threw in on top of it, you know, almost losing her at that same time, you're having all of those shifts in your hormones. And then in a couple of weeks, having to go back to work also with school on top of it, by all means, I should have crashed and burned. (laughs) But I was able to function optimally. And when I would find myself just really anxious and stressed out, I would go do a stim and I would feel a lot better. And I think to me using my stimulator long term, I think that has helped for me prevent having any issues with depression and postpartum depression. 
And sometimes the symptoms, some patients with, especially with autoimmune diseases, they'll have a reprieve during the pregnancy. But during that postpartum period, maybe even extending out a little longer, you see a recurrence of the inflammatory problems and the autoimmune disease, and it actually comes back even stronger. Did you see any postpartum headaches, postpartum inflammation in your joints? Have you seen anything like that? And in your experiences and knowledge about other people who have EDS, because I know that you're very involved in anytime you see an EDS patient, you want to talk with them about their lives have gone. How would you relate your experiences with theirs or with what you would have expected? I didn't know what to expect. Honestly, I was pretty terrified of what was going to happen if I wasn't able to take my medications and get Botox and maybe use VNS. But I had a really great OB who was like, these are certain things that you need to function optimally and to have your pain well controlled. So we're going to keep these things on board. And he was very supportive of that. And I think that that helped me get through the pregnancy and the postpartum period. I was in a mom's group with four or five other girls with EDS. And so I was able to see that some of them, I think with hormonal shifts, like some of them are struggling with some depression and anxiety and things like that. I think I had a little bit of an issue right when I first was pregnant, just maybe with that hormonal shift. I think that was the only time I had a little bit of depression, but I I know a lot of the other moms were having the same issues with just the chronic pain and like debilitating fatigue and things like that. So I definitely heard a lot of the same problems that I was having. One thing that I did not have an issue with was my, I had a C-section, so my skin healing afterwards, but I had a wonderful OB who was very careful and he put almost like a wound vac over top to help me heal and keep everything just a little extra support. And I shared that with the other moms and I think almost every other person had complications in their wound healing, whether they had a vaginal delivery or a C-section. And I felt so thankful for my OB, especially in letting me continue my therapies that worked for me and also in just giving me extra support because I didn't have any of those complications. And I felt very blessed for that. So actually, you raised an interesting point. Actually, it's one that I was really hoping to get to at some point, and I'm, I'm glad you introduced it. So Obviously, a C-section is a major surgery, and it has complications. My wife, in fact, had complications ultimately associated with the fact that she had four C-sections. So she's a real champ. I'm going to put a plug in for her. And she doesn't have EDS, but she still had complications associated with having four of them. But your wound healing properly is atypical for an EDS patient, especially since there's so many layers that go through. And I'm assuming that some of the gynecological consequences of EDS, which you may or may not have experienced in the past. I don't don't know if you want to go into them if you do, but they can be exacerbated by having had a C-section. And this is truly just speculative. So I'm not suggesting that there's sufficient amount of science out there to support this, but it is interesting to me in the way you describe the healing process that I think that it's possible that vagus nerve stimulation by balancing the autonomic nervous system, Given the fact that we know that collagen is deposited in part guided by how the autonomic nervous system is functioning. So if your autonomic nervous system is out of whack, you will not heal properly. But if your autonomic nervous system is in balance and your inflammatory or your immune system is functioning more normally and doing more normal, not inflammatory tasks, you will heal more effectively and more completely. My suspicion is that by using vagus nerve stimulation, you were able to counteract some of the reasons why healing wouldn't have occurred properly. I'm not suggesting for a second that what your OB did with specifically treating the wound wasn't great and really helped you out a lot. But given the fact that other EDS patients that you were in that same support group with didn't have the same benefits, and the same experience, I'm throwing it out there as a possibility that vagus nerve stimulation by modulating the autonomic nervous system and keeping the immune system functioning in more of a housekeeping homeostatic state, you were able to heal more effectively and heal more functionally. So with that pretext, have you seen any changes in your joint mobility 
after having used vagus nerve stimulation. Years ago, when you started, we talked about the possibility that in the future, we may be able to see that collagen starts to repair itself if your immune system and your autonomic nervous system are properly balanced. Have you seen anything like that? The answer may be no, but I'm just throwing it out there. I think for me, not yet. I don't know if over time that will change. I've only seen that basically if I forget to use it, my stimulator, I am a hot mess. So like I'm visiting family right now in Ohio. So my normal routine is a little bit off and I couldn't figure out why I was starting to get rashes down my neck. My, I had a horrible headache and I was just having awful pain everywhere. And I realized I hadn't stimmed for two days and I did my stim and I felt so much better. So I think to say that it has been able to fix something in terms of the collagen formation and things like that, but I don't know over time what that benefit is going to look like unless I think I stop using my stimulator and I'm not willing to do that. (laughs) Right. No, we wouldn't ask you to do that. Let me ask the question in maybe one other way, and then we'll leave it at that with respect to this topic. In your prior five years before using vagus nerve stimulation, how frequently did you experience dislocations or other problems that would be associated with the laxity of the collagen versus now subsequent to using vagus nerve stimulation? Is it that could be attributable to the difference in the the muscle spasming, et cetera. But have you seen any differences in that? If you compare me five years ago to me now, it's huge. There's a huge difference. I was not functioning my best five years ago. I had problems daily just in chronic pain and muscle spasm and subluxations and just really a lot of issues with back pain and neck pain and shoulders popping out of place and things like that. I think it's probably like the big picture right now. Like I have the dry needling, I have the vagus nerve stimulator, I have the lower inflammation. I really try to work on just the big picture of how does this affect me as a whole. And I am able to function on a different level than I ever thought I would have been able to. Five years ago, um, things were very uh, dysfunctional Um, And so much that the person I was married to at the time said, I can't stay with you because what if I have to support you one day and you can't work? And, you know, you've got all this medical debt and, you know, you've got student loans and he paced out. So that was a very, when you mentioned five years ago, that was a very difficult time in my life to where I didn't have all of these tools, have something like my vagus nerve stimulator that helped so much with chronic pain and migraines and, you know, anxiety and just all of these things. Um, And I didn't have, you know, dry needling and, and things like that. So today is a much different picture and a different person than five years ago. I'm also a parent. And so for me, um, noticing and remembering what it was like picking up the car seat and the lack of sleep and we have screaming going on at 3 a.m every morning for a month or something like that i remember the physical pain and physical discomfort that i was in as a non-eds patient or a non-sufferer going into a situation like that i wonder or have and obviously you don't have like a comparison of pre-stim or pre-dry needling versus post. But did you notice that a lot of those challenges potentially as a new mother, you you didn't experience potentially as badly as you may have? Yeah, I definitely, you like hit the nail on the head there. So the lack of sleep for the past nine months, that has been huge. Carrying her in the carrier, my rib pops out constantly, like on a daily basis. So I definitely have to get adjusted to get that back in place, or I have just a ton of pain there. I don't know what it would look like if I didn't have the things 
in place that I use now, other than to tell you when I forgot my stim for two days and I could barely function. (laughs) So that to me says a lot. Like if I didn't have that, I would barely be able to function to do the things I need to do as a parent to take care of her. I mean, just carrying her, feeding her, changing her when things are subluxing or dislocating or just holding your child becomes something that a lot of people would not have so much of a problem with, but you can barely do it and function. And so, and forgetting my stim for a couple of days, that was a very solid reminder of that is what I'm like, not being able to use my stimulator. Yeah, it's a very unique kind of perspective that you have being both having suffered from it as a patient and seeing the benefits of all of the work that you've done, whether it's dry needling, VNS, whatever it is. I wonder if we potentially shift gears a little bit and ask your perspective as a practitioner. And is this something that you've been able to share with others without obviously going into specifics and seeing any response or benefit with your patients? Absolutely. I have recommended this to patients who, a lot of my EDS patients, but also a lot of my chronic migraine, chronic pain, chronic anxiety suffering patients. Patients who really want something to help anxiety and depression, but they don't want to take a medication or their medication is failing and they want something alternative for treatment. So it is definitely something that I recommend and use in practice as well. Excellent. If you could step back sort of from your patient existence and look at yourself as if you were a patient coming to you for help, what are some of the things beyond vagus nerve stimulation that you advise your EDS patients to do? I mean, obviously, we spend a lot of time talking about vagus nerve stimulation, and we do a lot on this podcast, but just as sort of as maybe a advice, you have the opportunity to potentially reach a lot more patients this way. What would you say to your fellow EDS sufferers as a healthcare provider? Hmm. Well, probably can't give medical advice to anybody um, in this setting, but I always focus on diet, like diet is crucial. What you're putting in your body and fueling your body with, it matters. And so having appropriate foods that you're taking in, I think having adjustments aren't for everybody with chiropractic, but if it's your doctor deems it safe, I think having would it be low velocity adjustments or anyone with hypermobility, I steer away from usually neck adjustments. But if you have a lot of pain and you can get, you know, your ribs back in place and those things like that, that's been helpful for me. And then the importance of sleep and stress control and those things can be very important as well. And so I really just try to focus on those basics. Like what are you feeding your body with? What are you fueling your life with? Because all of those things matter. Those building blocks to your body, you have to give them good things to support. Yeah. You sound a lot like us near the end of every single one of our podcasts where we go through kind of that full list of take a look at all of these basic things and look at all of the triggers that could be creating a bit more of an inflammatory challenge in your body. And essentially what it comes down to, I think, in a very basic sense is we each have a cup of how much our body is able to take before it begins to overflow. And in a case like EDS, the cup is a bit smaller than potentially somebody who is genetically not under that same pressure, right? The cup size is going to be different in in each individual. There's no question about it. But EDS in itself has a hereditary reason for why the cup is smaller And if we add more inflammatory challenge, if we continue to work to fill that cup as quickly as possible, then we're going to get to a point where it overflows way more easily. And what we need to do is A, assess all of the things that are triggering that inflammatory challenge, all of the things that could potentially be filling the cup as severely and as quickly as it is. And unfortunately, for a lot of people, it really does take looking at your day-to-day lifestyle and diet and stressors to affect some change there. And so this is what we are big proponents of when we get into this conversation at the end of every episode. We're also very big proponents of being able to increase your ability to handle those stressors. 
And that has a lot to do with the autonomic nervous system, being able to shift between sympathetic and parasympathetic when necessary, both sides of the same coin, both necessary in certain circumstances. But if you're unable to shift from sympathetic to parasympathetic in a situation like EDS as easily as you want to, then we're not able to impart that immune control, that neuroimmune control and shift our immune cell state to that of uh, homeostatic maintenance, supportive and building based perspective rather than the inflammatory let's protect ourselves from potential challenges sympathetic activation and so this is really important and this is where the vagus nerve foundational tools come into play that's a lot of what i talk about in the book and then adding in the situation where we really need a bit of a kickstart or a jump start to push us into that parasympathetic zone activating the vagus nerve using electrical stimulation is one of those amazing tools that we can utilize in a situation like yours. Anything to add there, JP or Abby? I was going to just echo everything you said, but I was also going to thank Abby for joining us today and and just say that I'm sure you feel this way because you've told me that it was a wonderful thing that you and I got to meet. But I want you to know that from my perspective, how great it was for my life that I met you and that we had the opportunity to to talk and to work together and that helping you has been one of those opportunities. I'm not a healthcare provider, so I don't have that joy of meeting somebody and helping them with their health and make them feel better directly where I get to feel that personal charge or thrill of making somebody else's life better. I got that with you through our conversations and through the things that you did. And to know that on top of it all, it wasn't just helping you, you were able to get pregnant. And I'm going to say that that's, it's got to have a little bit to do with the vagus nerve stimulator, I think. And the fact that there's another life out there that is in your capable hands. And that just makes me feel wonderful. So thank you for being you. Thank you for being part of, of our journey. And thank you for coming on today. And I look forward to continuing our collaboration as we move forward. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my story and my journey and for everything that you've done and, you know, helping me figure things out along the way too. And I hope that this information helps a light bulb go on for someone else that helps them find something that helps them in their healing process along their journey or just make their quality of life a little bit better than I feel very blessed to have been able to share my story. I'm going to echo everything that JP said. Thank you so much for sharing your story because it is going to light somebody up to say, I can do this or I can handle this or I'm I'm willing to put in the effort. That's exactly why we do what we do here. We are absolutely honored to have had you on. As uh, many listeners of the podcast know, we're very mechanistic and very kind of, we talk about the biochemistry, we talk about the immune system, pathophysiology of different conditions and how the body really works. And it's really amazing and, and a wonderful opportunity to get somebody on to talk about the positive effects of taking on some of these amazing tools and being able to actually live your life much more functionally and much more well. So thank you for sharing that story. For anybody who's listening, thank you for staying to the end here. Please feel free to share this information with anybody that you think could utilize this information. We are here to spread that joy, just one listener at a time and be able to share this wonderful information to affect many, many lives. So thank you for listening. Thank you for joining. And it's an absolute honor to have you here. Thanks again, Abby. Thanks, JP. And we will catch you on the next episode.